Good morning. I liked how I stepped up here and everybody just got really quiet. It's like I have power or something. I don't know. So glad that you are here this morning to worship with us. Um, even though it's cold outside, glad it's nice and warm in here where we can be together, uh, where we can just sing and worship and hear God's word this morning. Um, so we want to welcome you, whether you're here in person or online. If you're visiting with us this morning, in the pew in front of you, you'll find a welcome card. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment and filling that out, you can drop it in either one of the offering boxes as you head out. We would love to have a record of you being here with us this morning. And if you would like to sit down and talk with one of us as pastors, you can indicate that on the card as well. We would love to get in touch with you and to talk to you and to talk to you about what's happening here at the church. Um, if you're going with us to Men's Retreat, this is just a quick little announcement uh, this weekend. If you wouldn't mind just sticking around uh, here in the sanctuary after the service so we can make some plans uh, for Friday, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. If you didn't sign up and still want to get in, we could probably squeeze you in. So uh, if that's you, you can see me afterwards and we'll try to get you signed up if you'd like to join us for Men's Retreat this Friday and Saturday. Our scripture reading comes from Psalm 57, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 11 this morning. It says, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make a melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Will you pray with me this morning? God, we come before you and we just pray uh, that you are preparing our hearts for this very moment here this morning, Lord, as we uh, gather together as a church, um, as we spend time uh, worshiping you through song, and as we prepare to hear the word uh, that you have brought through Pastor Stephen this morning, Lord, I pray um, for this time of preparation um, that you are leading us, that you are guiding us here this morning, and I pray that you would just speak to us, that we would hear your word clearly, the challenges which you are laying on our hearts so that we might leave here uh, and enter into the mission work that you've called us to do in the community that you've placed us in. And we thank you for that. We pray for those uh, here this morning who uh, maybe are struggling a little bit with, with whatever it is that they've brought here this morning. Lord, I pray uh, that you would just do a mighty work, that you would just uh, relieve that burden from their hearts here this morning, Lord. I mean, I pray that we can do the same, that you would just use us maybe to encourage one another this morning. Um, that if we need to spend some time praying with one another, talking with one another, um, that we wouldn't just rush out of here, that we would take the time to do that very thing so that we can um, encourage one another to uh, the call in which you've placed on our hearts here today, Lord. We thank you for that, and we just ask your blessing on this time of worship together now. And those who are going to lead us, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bob? <coughs> First song is, O Worship the King, number 24. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy's face, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds thorn, and dark is the How tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and a friend. Amen. And to God be the glory. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
to God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. All come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath brought us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. We bow down, number 31. <clears throat> you are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heaven before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are king of creation and king of my life. King of the land and the sea, you were king of the heaven before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Amen. Well, these days we're, we're all going to just fall flat whether we want to or not. Amen. And we have a special singer who uh, has to get his music now. Hmm. <clears throat> 
Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me, a close relation, having a part in his salvation. Happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter how the teardrops start. <clears throat> I found the secret. Is Jesus in my heart? Happiness is to know the Savior. Happiness is to know forever. Happiness is to know the Savior. Happiness is the Lord. Oh, I messed up that last verse. Sorry, Teresa. <laughs> oh. Just thought that promise would be out. It's been a long time since I've heard that song uh, there. We uh, used to sing that one as kids quite often there, and uh, the blessing that is. Let's get ready to go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Today is uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. Uh, and then tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. It's interesting. I think one of the things that both of those things have in common uh, is the fact that we are made in the image of God. Amen. And as we are made in the image of God, that we should have a love and a respect for life, uh, all life there with that, and that we should fight and defend for uh, life and uh, for the dignity and the protection of life there together. So let's remember that as we go to the Lord in prayer together today. Uh, let's remember uh, Karen Patton and her family as they've lost Clifford this past week. I've got to just comfort them and be with them. And then uh, we know that several are out kind of fighting illness there, and, and we're glad to see several back with us today. And uh, that's a blessing as well to see God's healing hand uh, there as well. So we're grateful for that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, as we uh, come together today, Lord, we know that there's many injustices in the world today. And Lord, we know that you have placed us here to fight for righteousness, to fight for what is right. And so, Lord, as we think of that on a day like Sanctity of Life Sunday, uh, we are reminded there, uh, there the evil of abortion that is still present in the world around us. And so, Lord, we pray for an end uh, to this evil. We pray uh, not only for an end to this evil, but for uh, the necessity or that some would think of the necessity of it because we certainly know there's no necessity for it there but, Lord, we say that the, just the, even the desire for it would be taken away. And, Lord, help us to fight for life, to protect and defend all life, whether that life is in the womb or whether that life is outside of the womb, that, Lord, that we would stand up for what is right and that we would protect, that we'd understand that you indeed are both the giver of life and the taker of life, and our days are in your hand. And only you, uh, being God, have the right to take away life. And so, Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, just be with us and help us to be a voice for those who are innocent, a voice for the voiceless here uh, today to stand up for what is right. And Lord, we pray as we come together today, we just want to pray for some of those families in our church, Lord, that uh, we think especially of Karen and her family, Lord, as they're grieving, Lord, that you would just come alongside of them, that you would just comfort them and strengthen them. We pray for those who are uh, wrestling with illness, some with some of the, the colds and the flus, some also who are wrestling with COVID there, Lord, that you would just uh, touch their bodies, heal them, and bring them back, restore them to health. And then, Lord, just pray that you just protect and watch over us and preserve our health here throughout this time. And just pray that you be with us now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are going to Galatians chapter 2 as we're making our way here through the book of Galatians. <coughs> as we look at this, we're going to be looking at the idea, and I think if we were to uh, be there in Galatians, uh, where the Apostle Paul is, and as he begins to tell a little bit of his story, we would realize that uh, there's a difference between agreeing with the idea of something and actually living it out. Uh, we talk about this idea of being saved by faith and what that means, and, and that the, the uh, salvation is a gift by God, that there's nothing that we would contribute to it, but that was something that the Apostle Paul was 
uh, fighting against in his day to making sure that he was defending that gospel because there were some that were coming in just to say, uh, that, that's wonderful, Jesus is good, you, you really need Jesus, but in order to really be saved, in order to really have God's favor, you've also got to be circumcised and you've also got to keep the Jewish law. So Jesus helps us to do those things, but we've got to do our part. And uh, it may not be that exact struggle today, but we often face similar struggles as we look at that today. It reminds me, as we get ready to come into Galatians chapter 2, um, it reminds me there the idea of Ruby Bridges. At Ruby Bridges, some of you may be familiar with that name, is a young girl, a young five-year-old girl, who was the first to integrate schools in New Orleans down there in the South. She was one of the first to el- integrate elementary schools. In 1954, uh, the Supreme Court decided the pivotal case, Topeka versus the Bo- uh, Board of Education, or Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, and it was that pivotal case that said that uh, schools should be racially integrated. I, I think most of us on the face value would say, well, I agree with that decision. Like, we shouldn't institutionalize racism. That's wrong. There's something evil about that. Uh, And yet it's a different situation when you're a five-year-old girl to be the first girl to go to a school where many people don't want you, to where uh, there's a lot of opposition. And so the Bridges family had uh, been, uh, Ruby had been born on a a sharecropping farm, but the family had moved to New Orleans to seek better opportunity and better jobs. And uh, when the opportunity came, the federal government said in 1959 that the, the schools had to be integrated uh, there was five students who tested that made available, and Ruby was one of those. Her parents were divided on the issue. They, her father thought, why risk it? It's, you know, this is our daughter. Let's not put her into that dangerous situation. Uh, but her mother said, no, we, we want her to have the opportunities that we were denied as children. And so the decision was made there to enroll Ruby into that elementary school. Uh, I've got the wrong remote here. Uh, Oh, here we go. Too many hiding places here. And so they took that opportunity to enroll Ruby in there. And you've probably seen this iconic photo. For that first year, uh, Ruby was escorted by four federal marshals uh, to and from school every day under the threat there. Um, The first day of school, she never got out of the principal's office. There was only one teacher in the school that was willing to teach her throughout that first year. And that whole first year, she was in a class of one, often going to recess and eating lunch by herself or only with her teachers. And yet, she persisted. She persisted. She stayed there throughout the year. She completed her course that next year. Additional students enrolled uh, and the school eventually began to be integrated, and they were accepted there within the school. Uh, we say that because if we talk about the issue of racial equality, most of us would probably agree and say, yes, that's a wonderful thing. But it's another issue when all of a sudden it's your five-year-old daughter who's having to endure uh, being yelled at and being spit upon, having things thrown at her just to go to school. When we put the flesh and blood onto the idea, all of a sudden it makes a difference. You say, well, what does that have to do with Galatians chapter 2? In Galatians chapter 2, when they were talking about salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, almost everybody would have agreed with that. But there were some that were coming into the church that were saying, no, 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 you got to have law has got to be added to this. And and, uh, so now they wanted to take the opportunity to let's sit down, discuss this, and decide this issue once and for all. It's wonderful to talk about things in the academic sense, and if you've ever been to uh, a Christian college or a seminary, you know that there's nothing more than those seminarians and college students love to do than to sit around and talk about this doctrinal issue and this doctrinal issue, and what do you think about that? But here, all of a sudden, uh, introduce Titus, it becomes flesh and blood. It's a real issue that deals with real people. No longer are we just talking about this idea of whether or not we have to be circumcised in order to be saved. We're asking the question, does Titus need to be circumcised in order to be saved? Is he saved because of what Jesus Christ has done and what Jesus Christ has done only? Or does Titus have to do something else additional? And that's where we come to Galatians chapter 2. So let's read verses 1 through 10, and then we'll study this passage together this morning. After 14 years, I went up from Jerusalem to Bar- uh, with Barnabas and took Titus with me. I went up by revelation that communicated to them the gospel 
uh, which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might have uh, might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who is with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurs because false brethren seeking in uh, brought uh, in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty from which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel was for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter... Uh, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when uh, James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, and they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which we were eager to do. Here as we're looking at this, we see uh, kind of a situation that begins to develop. The Apostle Paul, uh, as the storm clouds are there on the horizon, has made the decision to go to take this gospel that he's been preaching. He's been preaching now for several years, 14 years. And he's going to go back to Jerusalem to where the elders of the church and where the apostles are. And he's going to go discuss this and say, are, are, are we on the right track? Is this, this the right thing that we're supposed to be doing? Now, he's confident that it is because it's come by revelation of God. But he's not necessarily confident that everybody's going to agree together. Uh, and there's afraid that maybe conflict and division will come within the church. But more than just talking about a kind of an intellectual idea, he takes with him Timothy that kind of puts flesh and blood onto it. This is the story of Ruby Bridges. This is the, the famous painting there by Norman Rockwell that deals with that. As we look at this, we want to look at this meeting that the Apostle Paul has here with uh, the leaders in Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting as we look at this, it's just kind of before the point of discussion. There's a little bit of discussion, when does this meeting take place? And you notice it says it takes 14 years after 14 years. What is the after the 14 years? Well, after 14 years after his last meeting? Or more than likely, it's 14 years after his salvation there on the road to Damascus. And so after 14 years, he comes up to Jerusalem. And there's two possibilities of what it could be. It could be in Acts chapter 11, uh, as we look at this, where he came and he offered famine relief there uh, to the saints in Jerusalem from the church of Antioch, and he could have had a private meeting together with the apostles. Or in Acts chapter 15, this could be the Acts chapter 15, what we often know as the Jerusalem Council. That they uh, very possibly could have had a private session where he met with the apostles before having the larger public session there together in the church where they decided this issue kind of once and for all. So there are those two possibilities that take place. Uh, and if you're looking here at the timeline of the apostle Paul, uh, it, possibly right around in there, somewhere in that area that we're looking there in the Apostle Paul's timeline. Two things as we're going to look at this this morning. The first one is this, is that Paul submitted his message to be examined by godly leaders. Uh, and as you look at Galatians chapter 2, the first part that you see there is that idea of submission or surrender. First of all, Paul was submitted and surrendered to God. And I hope you caught this, right? Why did Paul go up to Jerusalem? And there's a very simple answer to that. God, Paul went up to Jerusalem, or, or technically down to Jerusalem, if you're looking at the map. Uh, he went to Jerusalem because God told him to. And I went there, uh, went up by revelation and communicated them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. The idea of revelation is that God's spoken to him as an apostle. Uh, he had this privilege of direct revelation there with God. And God spoke to the apostle Paul and said, Paul, you need to go to Jerusalem and settle this issue. Uh, and so he, uh, knowing this is from God, goes there with God. And it just very simply reminds us that we just need to do what God tells us to do, right? Uh, we may not, like the Apostle Paul, have the privilege of direct revelation from God, but we do hold within our hands the direct revelation from God. And uh, 
when it comes to those issues, like, should I do what, you know, I kind of read this and studied this in the Bible, and I think this is what God's telling me to do. Should I do it or not? There's really no question to ask there. If God's told us to do it, the simple answer is, yes, we need to do it. And so, under the inspiration, the revelation by God, Paul goes up to Jerusalem. And he goes up to Jerusalem to meet with the church leaders. Notice what he says, that I, I, uh, to preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And as we look at this, we know that he meets with the apostles, the pillars of the church, with uh, Peter and with John. He meets with, uh, as we mentioned, James, who is Jesus' brother or half-brother here and who is the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, the author of the book of James, we believe. And uh, he meets with those, it's very possible he may have met with some of the other pastors of the church there at Jerusalem. And he comes to them and he says, uh, this is the message that I've been preaching. This is what God's delivered to me. This is what I've studied the scriptures and discovered. This message of salvation by grace through faith, and uh, that we're saved by what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we receive that gift of salvation by faith and by nothing else. And uh, there's no need for uh, Gentiles to be uh, circumcised. We don't keep the law. All that the law does is it points us towards what Jesus Christ has done. We are saved by what Jesus Christ has done alone. And he explains this message to them. And as they look at this, and as we understand this, they all look at that and say, that, 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 I mean, that's, that's right on the line. You just, I mean, you've got the right message. You just keep preaching what you're preaching. But it's interesting. He meets with them privately. You notice what it says here privately so as not to jeopardize the work, uh, to privately to those who are of reputation, this by any means I might run or had run in vain. The idea of having run in vain is that I've done all of this work and all of a sudden I'm going to get there and there's going to be conflict within the church and uh, there's going to split the church here that we're going to have and there's going to be conflict in the division. <coughs> Paul, I believe, was confident in his message because his message was revealed to him by God, but he was not necessarily confident in people. And, and we know that. If you know people, you've worked with people well enough to know, we know that oftentimes people are fickle. You don't believe that people are fickle, just watch politics, right? Uh, one political season, this person is great, and people are all for this idea, and the next political cycle comes around, and this person can't be standing anymore, and they select the next person. And uh, we've learned in politics, just wait long enough, the political winds will change, it, the, uh, People are often fickle. And, and so uh, under the pressure of conflict here, under the pressure of that, some may kind of soften their stand on the gospel message. Some may be kind of say, let's, let's kind of pacify and keep the peace. And, uh, and we know that that happens from time to time. And so Paul's a little bit nervous. If I go up there and they say, well, Paul, you know, that's really a, the right message to preach, but let's kind of hold off on that. Or uh, There could be a lot of different ways that this could go. And he's afraid that all of this work for the past several years uh, will have been wasted, that division will come in and will ruin the church. So he goes up and he meets privately. And he meets privately with them to share there. There was the danger that if disagreement came, the church would be split in two ways or in three ways. Um, but it's a blessing to see this, right? That unity is based on truth. And so he gets up and he shares, here, this is the gospel that I'm preaching. They agree with him. And they, they ground their unity in the doctrine and in the truth of God. Uh, it's not based upon cultural identity, whether you're Jews or Gentiles. It's not based upon national uh, ties. The unity that they experience as believers and followers of Jesus Christ is based upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. Uh, and that's the reality that we see. And so he went to the proper authority and he submitted to the proper authority. And he says, hey, this is the gospel I'm preaching. What, what do you guys think? And I, I don't know if you've ever done that, right? That, that's a, a dangerous thing to do or a fearful thing to do, is to say, this is my life's work. I've been doing this now for 14 years. Would you evaluate this and tell me if it's the right thing to do or not? Uh, what happens if, if all of a sudden they come back and say, Paul, you're kind of on the wrong track here. All of a sudden you're like, ah, 14 years is down the drain. What, what do I do now? And, and uh, but thankfully, it was grounded in the truth. It was based on right doctrine. They moved forward. Now, notice this. The Apostle Paul submitted to God. He demonstrated that submission to God by submitting to the right and the proper authority. He went to the church leaders, and the church leaders said, you're on the right path, keep going on the right path. But what he did not do for a moment 
was submit to the false brothers. There are false brothers who had crept into the church. And notice there they, they snuck in stealthily, right? They, they didn't come in announcing, hey, we are false teachers coming to draw away people from the church to this new doctrine that we're creating. They snuck in. And the idea there is they, they came in by stealth to spy out. They came in to do espionage, right? They were going to sneak in. They, what's this gospel that Paul's preaching? And then not only were they coming in to say, what's this gospel that Paul's preaching? They're saying, how can we pull people over to our side? We're going to pull people to our side. And it's interesting as we look at this, uh, we are introduced to Titus. Notice there in verse 3, yet not even Titus who is with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Titus is what we call the case study, right? Uh, it's wonderful to look at these ideas to talk about salvation by grace there up in the academic realm and sphere up there where it's all heady. But all of a sudden, uh, Paul says, no, no, I want to introduce to you Titus. Titus has been a fellow worker with me. He trusted Christ to save her several years ago. Man, he's been growing. He's been a great blessing and help. Uh, oh, by the way, Titus is not circumcised. He doesn't need to be. He's Greek. It, it was that point of conflict. Do we really believe what we profess to believe or do we only give lip service to it and then kind of go back our way to the old way of thinking? And Titus here was this case study. It was the application of truth. As a Greek, he was not circumcised. Um, and he did not become circumcised. It points out to us, as we'll, we'll discover as we go through the book of Galatians, that one of the problems that's being developed here in the church of Galatians was this issue of circumcision. Circumcision was kind of the, the point uh, conflict there. It developed into more than that, that not only do you had to be circumcised, but you also had to keep the Old Testament law, you had to keep the Old Testament feast days. And so they were saying that Jesus is good, but, but Jesus is not quite enough. Jesus helps you on the way, but you've got to complete it now. now that, and essentially what they were saying is like, not all Jews were Christians, but all Christians had to become Jews. And the Apostle Paul says, look, guys, you've now said that salvation is by grace. What do we do with Titus? And the question comes down to a real person. Uh, we wrestle with that today as we share the gospel with people. Must people become Western? Must they accept Western culture in order to become Christian? Uh, do they have to sing our music? Do they have to dress in our clothes? Do they have to adopt our culture? Uh, do they have to speak our language? And we, we say, well, no, 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 no. But we have to be careful because sometimes we confuse Western culture together with Christianity. If you were to look back at some of the early missionary movements, they expected people who trusted Christ as Savior to adapt Western culture and Western identity. And that's the same problem that they were experiencing there in Galatia. Do I have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? Or is Jesus Christ for Gentiles just as Gentiles are? Does he save us where we're at and, and make us righteous? Or do I have to change my culture? And uh, we understand and realize this, right? That, that we don't have to adapt Western culture in order to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Uh, that people in Africa or in Asia... Uh, they can still maintain an Asian or an African culture, and yet they can receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Yes, even things will change uh, in their culture, because even here in the Western culture, when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, things need to change. Uh, but we don't have to, to become a different than what we are. We have to become what Jesus Christ is calling us to be. And so you'll notice this, he didn't call them false brothers, or he called them false brothers, he didn't call them brother, he highlighted the fact that they were different. They were not, because sometimes that's where we find ourselves, right? We want to be nice people, we want to be liked people, and when false doctrine creeps in, we say, well, let's, let's, like, let's not cause conflict and division, let's, you know, th these are, are pretty nice people, let's, let's just, maybe we'll just kind of like compromise a little bit here. Like, maybe we can yield for that. And you notice he said, we didn't yield for an hour. We didn't yield for a moment. We said that the truth of the gospel is too great that we cannot compromise this foundational truth. And so they, they didn't for a moment consider saying, oh, let's kind of maybe shift a little bit. No, they didn't compromise for a moment. They didn't give an inch. 
Instead, they said, no, we're going to stand for the truth. And they recognized them for what they were. They were not Christians, right? They were false brothers. They were imitations. They were pretending to be something that they weren't so that they could take away the freedom and the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here. They did not submit for a moment to the false teachers. So yes, we should submit to God. Ultimately, our authority uh, there <coughs> is yielded and surrendered to God, that God is the authority in our life, that we submit to Him. God often directs that there through leadership that He's placed in our lives. But that leadership should always be surrendered and submitted to God. And if that leadership is leading us away from what the Scripture teaches, or is taking us away from sound doctrine that's found in the Word of God, then we realize this, that we don't submit to false teachers, to false doctrine. Uh, just because somebody claims to be a Christian doesn't necessarily mean they are. We need to hold them up against the standard of the Word of God. And if what they're teaching doesn't measure up, then we don't follow, we don't surrender, we don't submit. We direct them back to the authority of God. Amen. And so the Apostle Paul said, for, not for a moment did we surrender and submit. And so the, the end result is this, right? Titus never was circumcised. But why was Titus never circumcised? Because he didn't need to be. He was a Greek. Jesus Christ has saved him just as he was. He was working a transforming work in his life just as he was. Uh, the Old Testament law can never justify anybody, not even Jews. And so he didn't need to change his culture to become a Christian. He could follow Jesus Christ just as he was. And that brings us here to the second point. So Paul submitted to God and the apostles supported Paul in his message. When it came down to it, they said, nope, Titus doesn't need to be circumcised. And yes, we see and recognize that God is moving and working in your midst, and the work that you're doing is a work from God. And Paul, keep doing what you're doing. We see this, that they accepted his message just as it was. In verse 6, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. And so we see this, that God does not show favoritism. Why does Paul highlight this? Paul highlights this because we are tempted to show favoritism. We have the people that we like and the people that we don't like, and we often show favoritism to the people that we like, and other times uh, we disagree with. <clears throat> and so sometimes the people that we like, even when they're doing the wrong things or heading in the wrong direction, we excuse them. We say it's okay. You know, I, I, well, you know, I'm not really uh, going to say too much about them. Um, and so we show favoritism. We'll see it a little bit later on here in, in Galatians chapter 2. Peter comes to Antioch and even though he agrees with the right doctrine, his behavior begins to be the wrong behavior, and the Apostle Paul has to confront him. Now, if we're in that situation, we might say, well, you know, Peter's an apostle, and we can't disagree with Peter because he's an apostle. And Paul says, no, he's disagreeing with what God's revealed, and he redirected him. It also reminds us that, that no matter who we are, uh, we are prone or possibly to fall into error. Um, and so we, we have to be careful of that. We have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our doctrine to make sure that we're doing what's right. This doctrine of salvation by grace was the truth revealed by God. It did not need a celebrity endorsement. Right? Um, we know what celebrity endorsements are, right? And some celebrity begins to promote some product. And more than likely, I always like these beauty products, right? You know, some supermodel or something is like, oh, come use this shampoo. And you're like, that's the cheapest shampoo out there. You would never use that shampoo. Like, you're being paid millions of dollars to say this, but you wouldn't do it. Uh, that's a celebrity endorsement. The Apostle Paul is saying that the gospel, because it's the truth of God, it doesn't need a celebrity endorsement. We don't need some religious celebrity as like, I'm the super apostle, and I'm saying this is a message for you. No, this message comes from God. So who they are is what he's saying. doesn't matter to me. I, it, it, it doesn't all of a sudden become more important now um, even in religious circles, right, when people write books, what do they want? They want these 
well-known leaders to endorse their book. Can you write a recommendation in the cover of my book? And, and oftentimes, right, they'll send a book to them in the hopes and anticipation, and hopefully they've read the book. Worst case is when they haven't read the book, but say, oh, so-and-so has written a wonderful book about, like, you haven't even ever read the book. Like, Paul's not saying, I need some celebrity endorsement. He's saying, this is God's message. God doesn't show favoritism, so it doesn't matter whether you're a common person in the pew or an apostle, God treats us all here through the lens of grace. We're treated there uh, fairly at the foot of the cross. God doesn't show that type of favoritism. But he goes on to say, they didn't add anything to my gospel. And, and it's not Paul's gospel, right? It's God's gospel. But what is he saying? He's saying they didn't change anything. They didn't say, well, Paul, we uh, kind of see about four points here that you probably need to refine and correct a little bit there. Uh, you're missing something a little bit over here. You need to, to change this over here. You've got a little bit too much. And you kind of no. He said they endorsed, they accepted it as to say this message that you're preaching, this is right on point. Keep preaching this message. This is what Jesus was preaching. This is what we've been preaching. You keep preaching this message. This is right. You keep doing it. Uh, and so they didn't change the message at all. They accepted the message. Not only did they accept the message, they recognized God's call on Paul. There in verse 7, but on the contrary, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship uh, to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And here in this context of, of verses 7 and 8, the idea of circumcised and uncircumcised is dealing with Jews and Gentiles, dealing kind of with the national context there. Earlier on, it was dealing more... Uh, with their, the, the act of circumcision here, he's talking about the circumcised are the Jews and the uncircumcised are the Gentiles. And he's saying that the, they recognize that God had called me to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Notice, there are not two Gospels. And there was not two Gospels then, and there's not two Gospels now. There's not a Gospel for the Jews and a Gospel for the Gentiles. There's not two means of salvation. There's only one means of salvation and that's through Jesus Christ, that no one comes unto the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4, for there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to get to God, both for Jews and for Gentiles. What we have are two spheres of ministry. Peter was the apostle to the Jews, and because of his national identity, because of his ability to, to speak and to minister to them, he had that ability and calling to go primarily to the Jews. Now, as we study the book of Acts, right, who was it that opened the door of the gospel to the Gentiles? It was Peter, right? Peter opened the door of the church to the Gentiles for them to come in as they were uh, there. Paul's primary ministry is to the Gentiles. Now, notice he would always share the gospel with the Jews, and his uh, primary means of our method of, of ministry is that when he'd go into an area, he'd find the synagogue, and for the first couple uh, weeks, he'd share the gospel there at the synagogue. And until the point of the time they ran him out of the synagogue, he would share with the Jews, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. And then from that point on, he'd go to the Gentile, and oftentimes uh, he was uniquely equipped and gifted to minister to the Gentiles. These are two different spheres of ministry. What they recognize is Paul... The calling of God on your life is equal to the calling of God on Peter's life. You are an apostle to the Gentiles, just as Peter is an apostle over here, particularly to the Jews. Um, we recognize that call. They recognize what God was doing, that God was moving and working in the Gentiles, that Gentiles were being saved, and the message was the same message, whether it's for Jews or for Gentiles. There's no two messages, one message is, and they recognize Paul's ministry uh, there. But not only did they recognize his ministry, they partnered together with him. And when James and Cephas and John, uh, Cephas here is the Aramaic name for Peter. Uh, they're highlighting that because in particular the, some of the audience there are, are claiming Hebrew roots, and so they're highlighting that, that even though Peter was a an apostle to the Jews and to the Hebrews, uh, they recognized and they agreed with this message that Peter or Paul is preaching. It's the same gospel for Jews and for Gentiles. 
And they're saying even the Jewish church leaders, even those who were the apostles called by Jesus Christ, endorsed and partnered together with me, uh, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace had been given to me by which they gave me, Barnabas, or they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. What are they saying? They gave the right hand of fellowship. And, and oftentimes, right, that's what, that what we use. And I mean, we use that particularly oftentimes when we're talking about church membership and we're introducing somebody for church membership. And we're saying, you know, before you leave, make sure you give them the right hand of fellowship. And, and we mean that today. We're going to come up and shake their hand and welcome them in. Uh, but it was significant, the idea of saying this, that we are accepting them and welcoming them into the fellowship. And that's what we desire with church membership. When we give somebody the right hand of fellowship, that they become an equal member within the body. There's no like new people and old people. And, and you know, we're going to kind of put you on a, a probationary basis for a little bit to make sure that you're okay. No, we say we're giving you the right hand of fellowship. You're now one of us, that, that you have the same rights and privileges as one of us, but you also have the same responsibilities as one of us. And we want you to join in and be a partner together here in ministry. This is what they did for Paul. Paul, you're now one of us. Uh, We're giving you the right hand of fellowship. We're agreeing with your doctrine. We're endorsing it as to say, yes, keep doing what you're doing. We believe that what you're doing is, uh, we recognize that what you're doing comes from God and keep doing what you're doing. Now, it's important and significant because of this. Who they were accepting also was pointing out who they were rejecting. By giving Paul the right hand of fellowship and saying, you and Barnabas are doing God's ministry, you're sharing God's message, and we're going to partner together with you to say to keep doing what you're doing. They were saying to these false brethren over here, the message that you're preaching is wrong. You are not one of us. Uh, You are preaching a different gospel than the gospel that Jesus Christ has revealed, and we are not accepting your gospel. They gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They did not give these false teachers the right hand of fellowship. They said, "You're, you're outside because of this false message that you're preaching. They come to Paul and Barnabas and to say, you keep doing what you're doing. We are behind you 100%. We agree with your message. We agree with your gospel. You keep going forward with the gospel. The only thing that they asked is this, that you remember the poor. They desire that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was eager to do. The poor uh, probably refers there to the collection of the saints at this time. Jerusalem had experienced a famine both through the famine as well as the large influx of the church. We know that the church in Jerusalem was struggling, both through some of the persecution that they had experienced. And so uh, Paul is uh, saying, I- I'm happy to come alongside. They say, just, just remember the poor, the ministry to the poor. And Paul said, I, I was more than inclined to do that. Uh, and so we-, we agreed wholeheartedly to that. It-, it wasn't that this ministry right added to their salvation. They don't say, well, how you treat the poor determines whether or not you go to heaven or not. Uh, But it reminds us of this, right? That what we believe changes the way that we behave. If we have accepted and received the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, what that means is we cannot persist in the same way of living that we did before. And one of the evidences, one of the ways that we see that change take place is how do we treat those who are less fortunate than us? How do we treat the most vulnerable uh, in our world around us? Here, the poor were the most vulnerable. Uh, They'd have no political authority. They obviously had no wealth or no power. Uh, How we treat them is an evidence of what God is doing in our heart. Salvation should result in transformation. There ought to be a difference in our life where we can look back as to say, this is when I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, and this is when my life began to take a different course. Uh, You can see a change in my behavior, a change in my attitude. Uh, You can see that when I've trusted Christ as Savior. It also rings true of this, right? If we do not care or have compassion for people, we do not have the right doctrine. 
Now you say, well, I might be theologically sound, yeah, but your doctrine makes no difference in your life if it doesn't result in transformation within your character. If it doesn't change the way that we act and the way that we behave, if it doesn't increase compassion for our community, there's something wrong with what we believe or we don't truly believe what we profess to believe. We might have a, a mental agreement, but it hasn't come into our hearts and changed and transformed our hearts. And so he said, we request this one thing of you that you remember the poor. And Paul says, oh, we're happy to do that. We'll do that for sure. Good doctrine results in transformation. It results in good behavior. And so it leads us to this challenge that I want to leave you with two things in this challenge today. One is this. Do we know the gospel message and do we fight for it? I, I, the, the first part there is this. That we have to know what the gospel message is. We have to be grounded in the truth. And if we don't know the gospel message, we will never be able to recognize a counterfeit when a counterfeit walks in. Uh, they'll say, oh man, those people are professed to be Christians and they're, they're nice people and they're doing great stuff. I, I think they're Christians. We say, but their doctrine is wrong. Oh, well, you know, I, who are you to say that? Well, we have the objective standard of the Word of God that we hold up what we believe against the Word of God. If what we profess to believe doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's wrong. We need to know the gospel message. Secondly, we need to fight for it. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to be mean and surly and unkind, uh, but it does mean that we need to stand up for what's right. We need to stand up for the truth uh, because there are many today that are trying to subvert us, that are creeping in to spy on our liberty that we have in Jesus Christ and are trying to take it away. And so we need to fight for that gospel message and not allow the false teachers to rob our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Secondly, are we teaming up together with others to tell others about Jesus? When they heard this, they said, Paul, we're going to give you the right hand of fellowship. We're, we're agreeing with you. We're behind you. We support your ministry and message. You're not alone in doing this. Matter of fact, if it's the Acts 15 meeting, what they did is that we're sending a letter. right? You, you can take this letter to all the churches that you've ministered to, and you can say, we agree with your doctrine. There's a ringing endorsement that we put, we're putting our weight behind your message. We're partnering together with you. Are, are we teaming up together? It's one of the blessings I, I love about church membership, right? When you become a member here of Inglewood Baptist Church, you are partnering together for the cause of the gospel. Amen. That means that we, we give together for a common cause. We've just come through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering where we gave to share the gospel with people around the world. It also means that we partner together. When we have ministries and outreaches, that we partner together as a team. Uh, I think of our uh, block or our uh, trunk or tree outreach. What a blessing it was to see people teaming together and working together, uh, working together for the common cause of reaching our community for Jesus Christ. Are we teaming together? God wants us to get off of the bench and to get into the game. And he's calling us to do that. Are you getting off the bench and getting in the game? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer together. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for this gospel message that you've given to us, that salvation is by grace through faith, that we do not add to it through our works, through our church membership, through our giving. Uh, God, you do it all, and we receive that gift by faith. How grateful we are for that. But God, we're also grateful that when we receive that gift of salvation, you begin to move a change in our hearts. You begin to transform us from the inside out. And so, God, may we join together with others to reach Bedford here with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they, too, can know the hope that we have found in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand together this morning, and we're going to sing the song of invitation. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, then this is the opportunity for you to respond. So let's stand together, and Bob's going to come and lead us now in this song of invitation. Song 415, Room at the Cross.
the cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide and its grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is the fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you though millions have come there's still room for one yes there's room at the cross for you as we sing that second verse maybe there's somebody that god's laying on your heart why don't you pray for them as we sing that second verse together this morning Though millions have found him a friend And have turned from the sins they have sinned The Savior still waits to open the gate And welcome a sinner before it's too late there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there is still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Lord, we thank you that there is room at the cross. And God, your sacrifice is sufficient. Lord, help us to be about the business of telling others about what Jesus Christ has done for us. That there is forgiveness, there is freedom, there is hope that is found in Jesus Christ. And God, let us not remain silent on that good news, but let us be sharing that together with others. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done, what you're going to continue to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you take your seats together this morning, let me just share a couple things here with you. One is, uh, as you give, we're grateful for the giving that you give and your faithfulness and giving and be able to support our ministries and what we do. And so just the, the ways that we have to give there, the, the offering boxes are there in the hallways, the you can give online. There is an, if you're more of a digital person there, just by pulling up our website and following the prompts that are there uh, within that. Uh, or if you like to do it the old-fashioned way, you can still put it in an envelope and drop it off. But we appreciate your faithfulness there. Uh, your giving allows us to continue to share the gospel, to partner together here for the sake of the gospel here uh, in southern Indiana. Let me just share a couple things that we have going up. Tomorrow is... Uh, an opportunity we have here uh, in Serving for Hope. Hope Resource Center is our local pregnancy center as we talk about Sanctity of Life Day. Uh, we support that uh, and it allows us to put feet into what we say that we believe. And, and so one of the ways that we can support that tomorrow is that you can get a wonderful meal. Uh, I would recommend that you get a wonderful meal at Golden Corral tomorrow uh, because if you do that, you may get the opportunity to see your pastor waiting tables uh, there tomorrow. <laughs> I'll have the opportunity to participate there in Serving Hope, and, and uh, I'll be waiting there at Golden Corral. If you don't eat at Golden Corral tomorrow, which I wouldn't know why you wouldn't eat at Golden Corral tomorrow, uh, but there are uh, several other great options that, to come. Uh, Smoking Jim's participates in this. Um, Apron Strings is participating in this. And uh, all of the tips that are received this evening go to support uh, Hope Resource Center to continue the work that they're doing there with that. And so uh, we want to invite you to come out to eat tomorrow and then to tip generously uh, there with that. You know, uh, we would appreciate that work. Uh, 6 to 9 p.m. 6 to 9 p.m. tomorrow evening uh, there with that. <clears throat> the men's retreat is January 21st. Uh, we want to invite you to come out, as we mentioned, to just stick around a little bit, and we'll get together some of the details as we kind of do that. 
great opportunity for our men. And I want to encourage our men to come and to be a part of it. It helps to build fellowship and friendship here within the church. It also helps to disciple us and ground us in the Word of God. And I want to encourage you to make the most of all of these opportunities as you have them. And then January 31st will be our second great Bible challenge. It's kind of a, a fun Bible game night, Bible trivia night. And we want to emphasize the fact of this. You may say, well, I don't know the Bible real well. I'm no great Bible theologian or expert. That's okay. Come together. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of these will be team games and team opportunities. And so you can you know, just like let your team carry you. And you can just come and laugh and make fun of other people. Um, but I want to invite you to come out to that. That'll be 6 p.m. there, January 31st, and our, our night of fellowship with that. And we want you to come and to be a part of that. One more announcement that we have today, and we're excited about this. If you were here Wednesday night uh, in our business meeting, we made this announcement. But we have been blessed to be able to hire a new administrative assistant. Amen. And so if you have any conflicts or problems, I now recommend that you go to Kylene Leonard. And uh, she will be accepting all of those. Uh, <laughs> No, we, we are grateful that she has stepped up into that role, and uh, we know that she'll be making a difference in impacting here, serving alongside, and uh, we're blessed by that. So uh, you can congratulate her that you maybe need to pray for her. She works with me and Pastor Brian. Uh, there. But we are grateful for that opportunity here. Uh, <coughs> our blessing this morning uh, comes here from Hebrews chapter 13. And it reminds us here of the wonderful salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. You are dismissed today.